Assyria, Israel's adversary and tempter. How this empire tried, like many other empires that followed it, tried and ultimately failed to establish a direct pagan alternative and challenger to the God of Israel and his plan for Israel and mankind. So in order to achieve this, we're going to first get, get an overview of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, many characteristics of it and how it ran. Secondly, uh, review the conflicts between the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and that's the conflict and rod of mine anger section. The third section we'll be looking at, and we'll be looking at um, the section uh, Brother Jonathan just read, examining how both kingdoms of Israel and Judah failed when it came to choosing between God or Assyria as their protector. And finally, drawing out some exhortational points for our lives today, and really bringing some of the lessons forward into the modern times and the modern types of this uh, ancient Assyria. So, beginning then with an overview of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, those are the different aspects we're going to quickly touch on just to get an idea, a better description, a better understanding of this, uh, this entity. So first of all, geography then. The Assyrian Empire, Assyria is in an area in northern Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, and those are the Tigris and the Euphrates. And oh good, this is coming out quite well then on the slide. So here we have the Tigris, and here we have the Euphrates there. And you can see Nineveh and Assur there along the, the Tigris. So this area has not existed as an independent country since 609 BC, but the central area is in the modern day state of Iraq and the ruins of ancient Nineveh are within the agglomeration of modern day Mosul, which has been quite famous in the last few years because it was where ISIS had their main city before they were pushed out. Now, looking at the timeline of the Assyrian Empire, it basically, Assyria's history can be divided up into four main parts. The early Assyrian period, the middle Assyrian period, uh, the Middle Assyrian, no, sorry, the, the early, the old, the Middle Assyrian Empire, and the Neo Assyrian Empire. So, this is well, during the first two, Assyria was primarily a city state based around Assur, which, although it was the capital, there were a few other cities nearby that would be incorporated that were older. Now, the empire began to grow significantly during the Middle Assyrian period, which you can see a depiction of here but it didn't really start to come into conflict with Israel just yet because its borders, even though its borders were close to those of the United Kingdom under uh, David and Solomon, they weren't quite close enough. So it's the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which we're gonna really focus on this evening because that's the one that came into conflict with repeatedly and is most relevant to Israel. So you see here, these are the borders of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 824 BC. And then here you have it at the maximum extent that it reached in 671 BC. So that's just how much it grew in that period of about 150 years. Now, the Neo-Assyrian Empire had certain unique characteristics for the time anyway. It was the largest empire in history up to that time. And possibly one of the most brutal also. Now, Brother Ed mentioned the British Museum, and a couple of years ago they had a, an Ashurbanipal, a long uh, exhibition there, and it, they went into some detail about the punishment meted out to traitors, and this was seen as far beyond what most of the contemporary kingdoms did at the time. Now, this Assyrian Empire expanded for three main reasons. The first one I've put profit, and what I mean by that is extortion. You go into someone else's territory, you conquer them, and you demand tribute, usually of about 20% off the top. Secondly, they wanted to protect their trade routes, so again, it's money. But thirdly, also, it was preaching their deities. And this expansion began quickly, it began very aggressively, and so, for this empire, conflict was inevitable. Now, I've put up a slide here of the most important monarchs of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And you'll recognize some of the names there. I've put in red um, the most important ones. 
these are the ones that would have the most important contact with Judah and, uh, and the northern kingdom of Israel. There. And some of these names you'll recognize, particularly after these are mentioned already. There. And obviously, Sennacherib features very heavily. So, just to show you the expansion, that's a bit hard to read here, but you start off with the very original homeland, and you can see the kings here, and the progressive expansion further and further and further. So this is really from starting off in 910 to 920, you know, the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and really grew incredibly rapidly from that early point. So the rulership practices, and these are important to touch upon, because the one reason for the unprecedented success, unprecedented success of this empire was its ability to incorporate conquered lands into its administrative system. And many lands were directly annexed, although some were allowed to retain a nominal independence as vassal states. But being a vassal didn't mean true independence. To keep this nominal independence, you had to pay an annual tribute that would be sent to enjoy the protection of the kings of Assyria, although that protection was from the kings of Assyria as well. And when it came to the annual tribute, as many people found out, tardiness in paying or a sudden refusal to pay could mean the swift arrival of an Assyrian army within your borders. And I've mentioned also their deportation. And this factor cannot be ignored, especially in the context of the two Jewish kingdoms. Is the Assyrian Empire practiced a policy of mass deportation of conquered peoples within its territories. Now this was frequently used to punish defeated enemies and rebellious populations. You would take someone rebellious, break them up and dump them a long way from their homeland, making them far less likely to revolt against the overlord. But it was also used to develop new lands, to spread agricultural techniques, and similar to what the Babylonians did, when they wanted to increase the knowledge of other cultures at the empire's centre, the educated elites from different vassal states or conquered territories would be grabbed and taken to the centre to help create a more effective and more well-informed civil service. Uh, it's been estimated that 4.4 million people were relocated within the empire over a 250-year period, and of these, 85% were resettled in the Assyrian heartland. Now, this policy was especially relevant to the northern kingdom of Israel because many of their inhabitants were deported to the centre in what was known as the Assyrian captivity. And this next section, kingship and gods. Now, I've chosen to group these two together because they are, in the context of this empire, they are essentially inseparable. I'm going to illustrate this by reading an excerpt from the royal titles of Sennacherib. Now, this person clearly had a problem with ego because some of this is frankly beyond satire. But this is an excerpt, not even the whole thing, but an excerpt from the titles he probably gave himself and inherited. It's Sennacherib, the great king, the mighty king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, king of the four corners of the world, favourite of the great gods, the wise and crafty one, strong hero, first among all princes, the flame that consumes the insubmissive, who strikes the wicked with the thunderbolt. So, yes, it is almost beyond satire. I think uh, it sounds like Idi Amin's titles. The only thing he missed was last king of Scotland. I think. It's, uh, <laughs> Joking aside, what it does portray is the belief that the king of Syria is effectively the regent of the most powerful gods on earth and the tool of their judgments against the in insubmissive. In documents describing the coronation of the Assyrian kings, the king is specifically commanded by Ashur, the Assyrian national deity, to, in quote, broaden the land of Ashur and, quote, extend the land at his feet. So thinking about the central theme of this talk, it compares quite interestingly to Isaiah 66 verse 1. We read about God, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, trying to put themselves forward as, a, as an alternative. Now, here is Ashur, as frequently portrayed 
as a winged disc. And here in the larger picture is Ashur depicted hovering on top of the Tree of Life, which is a motif that was often used in this kind of reliefs and this artwork. Now this relief here, the bigger one, was taken from Ashur Nazipal, one of the early kings of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. It was taken from his throne room in Kala with the inscription, Vice Regent of Ashur. So that fits perfectly, a Vice Regent of Ashur. It fits perfectly with the king's position as the chief agent of Ashur on earth. Now the Assyrians saw their empire as part of the world being <coughs> overseen and administered by their national deity through his human agents. And according to their theological outlook, the realm outside of Assyria was characterized by chaos, <coughs> and the people there were uncivilized, they had unfamiliar cultural and religious practices. And it was the king, and by extension, the nation's duty to expand the realm of Ashur and incorporate these strange lands, converting them to the Assyrian order, civilizing them and bringing them over to the correct religious practices. So thinking back to the central theme of this study, which is to see how the Assyrian Empire presented itself as an alternative to the God of Israel and his plan, it made me think, and this is a, oh, well, I turned up with this, the same quote as uh, Brother Roger here in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. And just reading that there, because I think it's important to see how much of a, you know, they're imitating God. And we read here, obviously, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you should be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, an unholy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So it does appear to me, at least, that the Assyrian ideology is something of a twisted version of that passage. The Assyrians, they were to remain utterly obedient to the king in the capital, the vice-regent of Ashur. And in following their religion, they saw themselves as a peculiar people, and as a holy nation that was to act as a nation of evangelizing priests, not just within their own borders, but bringing the message to non-believers outside. Now, in the Assyrian makeup, the king of Assyria was as much high priest as he was monarch and king. And though not seen officially as divine himself, he was seen as the divinely appointed representative of Ashur on earth. And his power allegedly derived from his unique position among humanity and his obligation to extend Assyria to eventually cover the whole world was cast as a human civilizing duty and absolutely not ex oops, exploitative imperialism. Now, the king was also responsible for performing various religious rituals in support of the cult of Ashur and the Assyrian priesthood. And so there are numerous ways that this could be compared to Israel or Israel compared to it. There are numerous types or pa numerous pagan versions of the real thing. Melchizedek was the king priest of Salem. Samuel ruled as judge and high priest also. And Jesus, our coming king, is our ultimate and final high priest in that line. So all this points forward to the inevitable eventual conflict when this empire would come into direct conflict and contact with Israel and the Promised Land. So, moving into the next section... Israel and Assyria, Conflict and Oppression, Rod of Mine Anger. Now, as an intro to this section, I'd like us to turn up Deuteronomy 28 and look at some of the passages there. This chapter is crucial in terms of the fate of Israel having gone into the Promised Land. The blessings for obedience are listed, but also the cursings that will come as a result of punishment for disobedience. So you can see... I've Put them, I'm not going to read them all through, but I put the most important for quotations there and verses. There's 15, 25, and 36 through to 42 there on the screen. And we can see what the punishment would be uh, for, for disobedience. Verse 25, the Israelites would be smitten before their enemies. And they would be brought into a nation they and their fathers had not known. They would serve false gods. They would carry much seed, but gather very little, as the locusts would consume it. And the locusts would consume the trees and fruits of their land, 
and the children would go into captivity. And these would be, these are some of the curses for disobedience, and these would be incredibly prophetic when we look at what would happen. Now, if we look now at the timeline of conflict between Israel and Assyria, the overwhelming majority of the initial contact was with the northern kingdom of Israel for the simple reason that geographically it was much closer to Assyria and it was on the main invasion route through the Fertile Crescent. So, first of all, first up, Shalmaneser III and Ahab. So from 912 BC, this Neo-Assyrian Empire, having studied the science of war and weapons, having become the most effective fighting machine in the ancient world, springs forth out of its homeland. Shalmaneser III comes about 50 years later. He, was, he reigned from 860 to 825 BC, and he was at war for all but three of those years. And at the Battle of Karkar in 853, he crossed swords with Ahab of the Northern Kingdom, who was in a coalition of 12 other nations that was led by Hadadezer of Damascus, and that's the Ben-Hadad II of 1 Kings 20. And he provided a third of the alliance's manpower. Now, the result of this battle appears to be inconclusive because none of those 12 kings lost their kingdoms, and Hadadezer would go on to engage Shalmaneser at least six more times. And this is the Kirk monolith, by the way, that the details of that battle are listed. Now, what happens next is something of an interlude in the conflict and something of a reconciliation between uh, Israel via Jonah and Nineveh slash Assyria. So after the death of Shalmaneser III, there followed five monarchs who reigned over a period where the Neo-Assyrian Empire was much, much weaker. This was an 80-year period, and there's comparatively little information about these five kings. But we can plot the time roughly where Jonah prophesied, in 2 Kings 14.25, he's described as speaking the Lord's words to King Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam II reigned from 786 to 746 BC. So this was the second half of that 80-year period of Assyrian comparative weakness. And in this period, Jeroboam II was able to re-establish the northern kingdom's borders. So we know the story of Jonah. This is not what this talk is about. On the second time of asking... He went to Nineveh, this great city of perhaps more than 600,000 people and probably the largest city in the world at the time. Now on this occasion, they responded to the words of Jonah that the God of Israel would overthrow their city in 40 days if they didn't repent. And as a result, they were spared. But we witnessed the hostility toward them from the Israelites because they'd been exceedingly sinful. But as we know, this repentance didn't last. And we can't be certain which king it was who repented when Jonah spoke to them, but soon there'll be a king who had no interest whatsoever in repenting of his evil ways. Now we now come to Tiglath-Pileser, and there he is, with the umbrella over the top of him, being held by one of his aides, and riding in a chariot. Now, this he really, really began now a very aggressive and renewed campaign of expansionism. In 2 Kings 15, chapter before the one John read, he invaded Israel under the reign of Menachem. And he's bought off initially with a thousand talents of silver that were exacted from the mighty men of the northern kingdom. The tribute had its effect. He departed for a time, but the northern kingdom was now a vassal state once again. Now, six years later, there's a new king, Pekah, who had murdered his predecessor, Pekah Hiah, And he allies himself with Rezin of Damascus, and comes against Jerusalem. And King Ahaz of Judah, as we see, appealed to Tiglath-Pileser, who responded by coming, by taking Damascus, by killing Rezin, and taking large areas of the northern kingdom. Now this was when the deportation of the, king, the population of the northern kingdom really began in earnest. And Tiglath-Pileser recorded the details of this in his inscriptions. Now remember what was said in Deuteronomy 28, they will be taken out of the land, and this is where this really begins, the deportations really begin in earnest. So this passage was prophetic of Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. Abraham had begun in Ur, down, to, down here, and he would travel to Haran, much further up, but not really the Assyrian heartland. So the people now were, were indeed being taken to a land neither they nor their fathers had known before. 
And you can see here, just keep putting a pointer on my own screen, that's not going to help you, is it? No. <laughs> purple, <laughs> purple here. This is the first deportation by Tiglath Pileser in 734, 732. So you can see they are taken up the Fertile Crescent and right into the heartland around Nineveh. And there'll be later ones really within the next 15 to 20 years. So we're moving on now to Shalmaneser V and Sargon II, and these will be the other deportations um, that, that, uh, that occurred of the northern population there. So Shalmaneser V and Sargon II both came against Hoshea. Hoshea was the last king of the northern kingdom of Israel. It would appear that after initially rendering tribute to Shalmaneser, he decided to stop and try and ally himself with Egypt. So the Assyrian king comes against Samaria, and by then little of the northern king really re kingdom remained. It would appear that he was captured outside the city, and then the Assyrians laid siege to it, which fell after three years, although the final capitulation was to Sargon II. And it was then they took the final inhabitants, which they numbered at 27,290, and deported them beyond the Euphrates, a long way to the east there. And this was when the northern kingdom was brought to a definitive end. And there wouldn't be a return of a remnant the way there was with the return of the, the captivity of Judah either. And we see in this there was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. In Isaiah 7 verse 8, Ahaz had come to him and he said that for the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken that it be not a people. So at the time of the invasion of Judah by Israel and Syria, this end of the northern kingdom was prophesied then and it happened well within that 65 years. What's also interesting in the Deuteronomy passage is the use of the symbolism of locusts. Now, locusts are used to symbolize Assyria, both in Joel and in Nahum. And when in Deuteronomy 28 it speaks of the locusts consuming most of the seed they plant in the field, it could well be signifying they're cultivating when in captivity for the primary benefit of their Assyrian overlords, with most of the harvest being taken and only a little left to subsist on. But at this point now, the Assyrians had overrun the northern kingdom and the attention turns to Judah. Oh, sorry, missed one of my slides there. There you go. That's the image depiction of the fall of Samaria there. <coughs> so moving to probably one of the most, the most famous encounter between Assyria and one of the Jewish states. Isaiah chapter 10, you can turn this one up or you can just take it from the screen there where I've highlighted uh, the most crucial bits. Because from verse 5, there begins a long woe against Assyria. The initial section, though, describes God's commission to Assyria to go against a hypocritical nation, that being Judah, to take a spoil and to tread them down the streets. However, we see early on that the goal of the Assyrian is not merely to chastise, but the goal of the Assyrian is to destroy. In verse 11, they basically say, I overran Samaria and her idols, when I also do the same to Jerusalem? And the story is taken up in 2 Kings chapter 18, where Hezekiah was a faithful king, more so than those before or after him. He removed the high places, he broke the altars and cut down the groves. And he trusted in God, so in verse 7, he rebelled against Assyria and served them not. So in 2 Kings 18, verse 13, in the 14th year, Sennacherib comes up against all the fenced cities of Judah and takes them. Now this invasion wasn't a standalone invasion against Judah. It was part of a far greater campaign in the entire Middle East with the aim of bringing these regions back under Assyrian control. And it starts off with successful invasions of Phoenicia and Philistia. And then this invasion comes, which devastates Judah. And on Sennacherib's prism, which is illustrated there, just there, he records the 46 Judean walled cities taken. And he also records the count countless small towns and villages. And there's a lament in Micah chapter 1, verse 8 to 16. The prophet lists some of the towns destroyed. And Lachish there, with the relief here, 
is probably the best example. Lachish was Hezekiah's second greatest citadel, and it commanded the approach to Philistia. Now, Sennacherib claimed in this invasion to have taken 200,150 inhabitants of Judah captive, and that's not at all an unrealistic number. Although commentators have suggested that Isaiah 35 verse 10 indicates that these captives were permitted to, uh, to return once the invasion ultimately failed. So against the southern kingdom of Judah, the Assyrians were indeed the rod of God's anger, from Isaiah 10 verse 5, sent to chastise, but not to destroy the kingdom, because that would have meant the end of David's line and the end of God's plan for the world. So ultimately, we'll go on to see it was the attempts to do just that, to end David's line, that would be Sennacherib's and ultimately a serious downfall. Now, as we've seen the Neo-Assyrian Empire, it was expansionist, it was pagan, it was opposed to the God of Israel, it was determined to spread its own governance and religious system throughout the Middle East and ultimately throughout the known world. And this put the Jewish states in an unenviable position because they were directly in the firing line. The Northern Kingdom bordered the Neo-Assyrian Empire even before the expansion began. So when the Imperial Army, they came, they had a choice. <coughs> they could put their faith in the God of Israel and his protection, or they could pay for the protection of the king of Assyria. And in doing so, they'd have to accept the financial cost, the degradation, the desecration of holy places, the compromise of not following the God of Israel, but instead following idols backed by a supreme worldly power instead. So, how did they fare? Well, Shalmaneser III and Jehu to begin with. We know that Jehu followed Ahab. He destroyed Ahab's whole family. He killed the worshippers of Baal. He destroyed their idols and temple. But he continued the sins of Jeroboam in that he tolerated the continued presence of the golden calves. So in 2 Kings 10, Jehu was told that he would get his four generations on the throne, but then God would cut him short. And in that section, you can read of the difficulty that Hazael of Syria caused Israel by attacking all its borders. Now, admittedly, I'm relying on the Syrian accounts here, but this is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser, also in the British Museum, sitting in the Assyrian section there. And this here is either bending forward, kissing the ground before Shalmaneser, is either Jehu himself or one of his ambassadors. And this depiction and the, the notes that go with it on the obelisk suggest that rather than pray to God for protection and delivery, he went instead to Shalmaneser for protection. And it reads there on the obelisk, the tribute of Jehu, the son of Omri. I received from him silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase with pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king and spears. So Jehu took the easy way out easy initially, or the faithless way out, and he certainly wouldn't be the last, because the next example failed in much more spectacular fashion. And this brings us now to, to Tiglath-Pileser III and Ahaz. Tiglath-Pileser III, he's the first Assyrian king mentioned in scripture as being in direct conflict with either of the Jewish kingdoms. And we've already read about his victories against Menachem and Pekah, so we'll look now in a bit more depth at his involvement with Ahaz and the grave error made by the king of Judah. Now in Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah quite clearly says to Ahaz, in the quotation there we can see on the, on the screen, telling him, don't fear, as the plan to come to Israel and put a puppet king on the throne would fail, and in any case, within 65 years, the northern kingdom would cease to exist. But does he listen? No. Let's look at the event, the account of the events then. Again, bringing up some of the most crucial passages. 2 Kings 6, verses 7 and 8, we read, he, write, he goes to Ahaz and says, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me. And then we read what he takes from the house of the Lord. <coughs> In 2 Chronicles 28, this is the really important bit. tiglath pileser king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. 
And in another version, it's translated that he gave him more trouble than help. So he removed all those things from the temple, committed all that sin, all for the king of Assyria, made the sacrifices, ceased to worship the one true God, probably prevented the people from doing the same, all for the sake of the king of Assyria, who offered him no comfort anyway. Looking at Sennacherib and Hezekiah, returning to back now to that invasion of Judah. Hezekiah, in desperation, tries to buy off Sennacherib. When this Assyrian wave comes over and takes most of the land, he writes to him saying, I've offended thee. And Sennacherib says, well, OK, give me 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold and I might forget about it. Sennacherib takes the tribute, stripped from the temple area, but he sends his army with Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabshakeh up to besiege Jerusalem anyway. And then what happens then? What is, what's the message given to Hezekiah by Sennacherib via the Rabshakeh? Why are you putting your confidence in Egypt, which he had done temporarily? They defeated Egypt. Egypt is a broken splinter that you cannot lean on. And who else are you going to put your confidence in? On your God? Because you've removed the places of worship to him, and it's because of his commission to come and destroy this land that we, Assyria, are here. Now, these were incredibly damning words, and what's more, the people, not just the elite, but the people there on the walls could understand because Rabshakeh taunted them by speaking in Hebrew. Now, it's been suggested he could have been a, a renegade rogue Jew, or he could just have been a very well-informed and effective diplomat. But he knew exactly what he was saying there to taunt them. And this is where Hezekiah really had to call and fall back on his faith. He knew he'd made the mistake trying to rely on Egypt. He knew he'd made a mistake trying to buy off the Assyrians, and he damaged the holy places to come up with this tribute. He was going to have to fall back and rely on his faith, he knew that he was the line of David, and he had no son at this point, and therefore he would have to survive. And he also needed to have faith that God would forgive him for his mistakes. Now, this we come now to the most blasphemous, but also I think it's the most interesting part of this speech. And this I will quote directly. It's also there on the screen. This is Isaiah 18, verses 31 to 32. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil and of honey, that ye may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. I describe these as ho the three hollow promises of the Rabshakeh, but talking to Brother Ewan McLeod at dinner, he suggested maybe call it the subtle promises of Rabshakeh, because they could be there was a hint of truth uh, in all of them and what they could be what they could do. But let's look first then at the, the vine and the fig tree, because the vine and the fig tree are mentioned a great deal in scripture. I'm going to look at think. I'm thinking of two mentions in particular. In 1 Kings 4, verse 25, we read, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And secondly, Micah's prophecy of the messianic age in Micah 4, verse 4, that they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. So the Assyrians, or more specifically Sennacherib, is putting himself forward as able to provide a situation of permanent rest for Israel. And like the situation under the rule of Solomon in the United Kingdom, prior to the division, a time of great prosperity and peace. And he's effectively putting himself forward as an alternative messiah offering them this new land, a new kind of promised land. But Micah had given this prophecy at this time. So I wonder if these words were prophesied to Jerusalem before this episode as a reassurance that uh, this would not come, the Assyrian invasion would fail, 
and the future would be at the Lord's Mount in Jerusalem. As I touched on before, they promise to bring Judah into their own land, a land of abundant food, drink and comfort. And this reminds me of a twisted version of the gift of the promised land there, a land of flowing with milk and honey. And thirdly, the promise of salvation. Now, there are so many potential passages this could be an imitation of, but I ultimately consider it, consider the Abrahamic covenant and the messianic prophecies. Because would Abraham's seed be as numerous as the stars if they sought the protection of Asher? Was that what was being offered? Would the commonwealth of Israel ultimately have no use for Christ if their salvation and rest lay elsewhere with another state? So ultimately, we know exactly what happened to the 185,000 men of the Assyrian host. And that 20 years later, Sennacherib was assassinated by one of his own sons in a palace coup. Now, it would have been nice if this had been the last word in the relations between Assyria and Israel. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite. Hezekiah's son Manasseh, who did great evil through his life until his repentance at the end of it, found himself once again in a vassal situation. Now, I'm just going to touch on something here. I don't want to open up a whole new line of inquiry, but I found something quite interesting that uh, King Isar Haddon, the successor and son of Sennacherib, um, created a succession treaty to be signed by all of his vassals, and they were summoned to the centre of the empire. And this succession treaty was discovered in an archaeological dig in 2009, which laid down the treaty conditions imposed. And those who studied it said that it bears a very strong resemblance in its syntax and its construction to many scriptural passages. And there seems to be a, something of, of an academic consensus that section 56 of this treaty is so similar to Deuteronomy 28 that one must have been lifted straight from the other. The mistake the academics make <coughs> naturally is to say that Deuteronomy 28 was lifted straight from the writings of Esau Haddon, where we know it was the opposite. Now, if true, this is yet another case of the Assyrians and quite possibly very deliberately imitating the God of Israel in what they offer to his people and indeed the whole world. Now, I didn't go into too much detail because I'm not qualified to analyse Hebrew and cuneiform grammar and syntax, but anyone who is interested in looking at the studies of that section, I'll leave that QR code up at the end and you can hold, <laughs> bit of, bringing a bit of technology here, you can hold your phone and then you can get the link straight to the academic studies of that section. But I have to say, I'm not, we're running out of time and this is not my area of expertise at all. So finally, bringing it back, Israel and Assyria, exhortational points for our lives. Now, from the beginning of its interactions with Israel, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was an adversary but it was also a source of temptation because it offered God's people an alternative to faith in the God of Israel and faith in his protection and salvation. Now, they could have faith in the word of God and, or seek to be protected by the iron and the power of the worldly Assyrian Empire and in doing so come to an accommodation, a compromise with its own system of worship, deity and kingship. Now, this opposition to God in this form goes back way before the Assyrian Empire, really starts off where well, I've taken it back to Genesis 10 with Nimrod, because the beginning of his kingdom was in Shinar, and out of his descendants were those who built Nineveh and Assur and began that early Assyrian period. And they were really some of the very early men who made themselves in opposition to God. The nature of Assyria goes back all the way to those times. Those men at the Tower of Babel, who wanted to make a name for themselves, meaning they wanted to challenge God and build up their own fame and glory. And the Assyrians believed that their faith should be spread to the whole world, and they were very aggressive about it. And they went to, those who were resisted were punished and humiliated for their resistance. But the Assyrians didn't brandish a stick at the Israelites. They offered a carrot too. Ooh, quite got this. Now, remember the, wor the words of Rabshakeh. You'll have your own land, your own vine and fig tree. So basically, your needs will be taken care of and you will have rest in Sennacherib and in Syria. And what did they do for that? Well, 
in order to get that rest for Sennach within Sennacherib in Assyria, they would have to submit to the will of the Assyrian king and by extension Ashur. They'd have to pay the annual tribute and possibly also provide support for the Assyrian army as it went about its business expanding the empire and broadening the land at the feet of Ashur. So I've put up this slide here. How does this compare with our experience these days? Because we don't have an Assyrian army or indeed a Russian army at the gates ready to invade and deport us to some other part of Eastern Europe. What we do have is a world, and it's with own religions and philosophers, that has laid siege to our faith, has laid siege to our way of life, and indeed trying to lay siege to our minds. Now, there was a best-selling book from a couple of years ago that I saw a few acquaintances reading, and it's this one here, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. This basically means man as God, or man is God, which is fascinating, fascinating, very straightforward statement about the philosophy of the world. So we can either put our faith in God or choose to go with the world and what it offers. Now, like the Assyrian offer to Israel, the offer is tempting. The humanistic world philosophy or world religion, it claims to offer comfort and it claims to offer reassurance without any need for God. A few years ago, some of you might remember these buses going round in London, the London Red Bus with the, uh, the British Humanist Society, I think it was. There's probably no God. Stop worrying and enjoy your life. Yeah. So, like the ancient Assyrians, this, the humanism pushes its view that you don't need God. There are great pleasures that can be enjoyed, even if it is the short term. More recently, we see Britain, despite being supposedly a Christian country, Christianity is finding itself increasingly marginalised. In some spheres of society, it's almost persecuted. People are having to leave jobs for conscience issues, as I've noted here. And you may well have heard of this uh, famous case in Belfast that was called it was the so-called gay cake case, when the bakers were sued for refusing to bake a cake with the icing with that inscription there. It's not enough to be silent in this world. One is expected to support the world and its values. Silence is not seen as submission or neutrality either. Silence is apparently now violence against this new order. Ultimately, the humanist mentality wishes to push Christianity out altogether because it sees it and us as barbarous, as backward, as unenlightened, just as the Assyrians saw those faiths outside of their own as just mere idols that wouldn't stand against Assyria. So what does the world ultimately offer, though, in comparison to what God through Christ offers? If we think back to Ahaz and Tiglath-Pileser, Ahaz had to pay a huge amount of tribute, but Tiglath-Pileser was of no comfort to him. Hezekiah tried to buy off Sennacherib, who took the money and came against Jerusalem anyway. So Assyria required continual tribute, but offered no rest or salvation, no permanent rest or salvation anyway. Now we contrast that with Christ, who died for our sins once only, and from then on no further sacrifice was required. All we need do is to remain faithful, and we have that rest in Christ. Now Hezekiah had erred in relying on Egypt, but unlike Assyria, the God of Israel had the capacity for forgiveness. Similarly, the world demands constant tribute, but offers no rest and no forgiveness and no salvation. The world and its followers may even taunt you for your beliefs, taunt you for your failings, as the Rab Shaker taunted Hezekiah. But it does so in order to tear down, whereas God, when he pointed out his followers' failings and tries them, does it in a spirit of love to admonish and to build up and to refine. Now, I said in the previous section it was a shame that the destruction of Sennacherib's army wasn't the last word in the conflict between Assyria and Israel. Well, the conflict continued in terms of its spiritual successes. So much was passed on to Babylon, and then the other empires that followed tried the same thing. And a new Assyria is going to come against Israel also. Now, in case you don't know, the coat of arms there is the coat of arms of the modern-day Russian Federation. Now, it has its weaknesses right now, but ultimately it will still come against Israel and the land. Unlike the Assyrian of old, 
the words of Isaiah 14.25 will apply to this new Assyria. I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. So the final victory against what Assyria represents, which is man and his own views and his own beliefs, challenging God. The final victory won't be until the kingdom age, when the worldly opposition to God and his plan that Assyria represented will be defeated for good. So I'd just like to close with this thought here. And we think a choice between the Commonwealth of Assyria being the world and the Commonwealth of Israel. We think back to those words, make an agreement with me by a present. Eat ye every man of it, then you'll eat every man of his own fig tree, everyone it is vine, everyone is fig tree, that you may live and not die. Just don't hearken unto Hezekiah, because the Lord won't deliver you. As that's the empty promise from the world of salvation and a comfortable living. All you have to do is make an agreement with me by a present, but an ongoing one. We come to the Commonwealth of Israel and what we're told here. This is Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may improve what is what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? <coughs> Let's think of those words from the Commonwealth of Israel and the coming true promise of eternal life. Thank you.